Good evening, everybody. Good evening and welcome to Briz Science, the first Briz Science for 2023 with an absolute packed house. I can count like six spare seats around the room, 330 odd people here. So huge round of applause to everybody here in person. <laughs> Marvellous. And also a special welcome to all of those watching on the live streams, either on Facebook or through the website. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, sorry you, you couldn't get a seat here tonight. Um, but, and of course, hello to those watching this on YouTube days or years in the future, whenever that might be. Hi. Um, so thank you so much for coming. If this is your first time here, welcome. Bridge Science is a series of free public lectures of science held once a month here at the fantastic State Library put on by the University of Queensland. And we aim to bring not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators to share their latest research, cutting edge science with the people of Brisbane and beyond. Now, I'm your host for this evening, Joel Gilmore. I'm very excited to be here. And I'd, of course, like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders past and present. And acknowledge the incredible contributions they've made and continue to make to our knowledge of this country and indeed our world. So tonight, tiny bit of housekeeping before we get started. First of all, if you're here in person, we're going to have some drinks and nibblies after this amazing speaker. So make sure you hang around. Lots of chance to chat and discuss the mysteries of the universe. If you have a mobile phone on you, now would be a fantastic time to put it to silent. Yes, there we go. Marvellous. But don't turn it off because we are going to be taking questions through the wonders of technology. Up on your screen right now, oh, so close. Um, as soon as the slide deck happens to rotate there randomly, there it is, amazing. We have a QR code that will take you to a question form. If you're online, you can use the bit.ly link there, bit.ly slash brizsciqa with four capital letters. Um, log in there and you can ask the questions as we go or at the end. I will then go through as many of these as I can at the end of our talk. But as I said, there'll be lots of time for chatting over nibblies later. I think that's all of the housekeeping we need for now. So tonight, it is my incredibly great pleasure to welcome our speaker, Professor Tamara Davis. Tamara is an incredibly accomplished human being. She has represented Australia several times in Ultimate Frisbee and more. She is a regular guest host of Catalyst on the ABC. She has a plentitude of awards, including being a member of the Order of Australia. And in her spare time, she is one of the foremost astrophysicists and dark energy researchers in the world, including currently running the Australian Dark Energy Survey. Uh, so she is the perfect person tonight to illuminate dark energy for us. So for a talk that will be truly out of this world, please put your hands together for Professor Tamara Davis. Thanks, Joel, and hello, everybody. Welcome to this evening. Thank you so much for coming. It's quite overwhelming to see so many people in the crowd. I know that there is a big diversity of people in the crowd here tonight. There's some uh, professional physicists, some UQ alumni, lots of people from the public, and a whole bunch of kids. So I've tried to chuck in this talk stuff that covers interests for everybody. So hopefully we get there. Um, and I'd like to also start by doing, uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which I work and live and where we are tonight. Uh, and I thought that I would mention, because we're talking about the dark side of the universe today, a really, really cool thing that I love about Aboriginal astronomy. And that is that I was brought up in this sort of European tradition where you look at the bright points in the sky and make constellations. But here in the Southern Hemisphere, we have a great view of the Milky Way and these dark patches across the Milky Way. And some of the Aboriginal astronomy constellations come from those dark patches, including the famous emu that's in the Milky Way. I think that's particularly apt considering we're talking about the dark side of things tonight. So to kick us off, um, let's have a first start with our place in the universe. So here's a picture of Earth from space. You can see the International Space Station in the foreground here. Um, and here, how, do you, everybody know this picture? One of the most famous pictures of all time, taken by the Apollo astronauts as they were orbiting the moon. Um, very, very cool image of the Earth. This is also an image of the Earth. 
Um, it might not look like the Earth that you're used to seeing, but that's because Saturn's in the way. Um, if you look closely, there's Earth. <laughs> so this was taken by the Cassini spacecraft, as it was, uh, which went and explored Saturn and had a look. And so this is the uh, little dot that's us looked through Saturn's rings. That's what we would look like from Saturn. And of course, this is the most distant image ever taken of the Earth. This was taken by the Voyager spacecraft. Uh, and this is the beautiful quote from Carl Sagan here about this tiny little dot that you can see, which is Earth on which everybody who has ever lived, all humans, have lived out their lives on the, that tiny dot. And it's very humbling to think about the perspective that we get when we see Earth from so far away. But that's actually really close to us from my perspective, because I study cosmology. I study the universe as a whole, and this is like our backyard. This is our neighborhood. This hasn't even like gone out of our suburb yet. Um, if you, ooh, oh, something's gone a bit weird there. Okay, so if you look at where we are, sun and our solar system sits in the Milky Way, we're about 26,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way. Uh, and this is what our Milky Way sort of approximately looks like, uh, with a bulge in the middle, our sun out in the outskirts here, and the, the disk of the galaxy in here. Um, and someone, when, I, when this talk was advertised, someone on Twitter asked me to show what the orientation of the Earth was with respect to our galaxy. Um, and so I thought I would answer that question. Ooh. Oh, this is going very weird. I'll turn that off and do this. Um, and so that's Earth, not to scale. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so the center of our galaxy is at about 29 degrees declination from minus 29. So that's about the angle. So one of the reasons that we have such a great view of the Milky Way from the so southern hemisphere is because we're sort of pointed slightly, with the southern hemisphere slightly pointed towards the center of the galaxy. Whereas if you're in the northern hemisphere, you just sort of see the outskirts more than the actual heart of the galaxy. And so that's why the, solar, the, the galaxy is, looks so spectacular from here uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. And this is a photo that one of my PhD students, Josh Calcino, took um, of the Milky Way from the telescopes that we use out at Siding Spring in the middle of New South Wales. That's the that's, um, sky mapper that you can see up there. And in the left there, you can see two fuzzy blobs. Those are the Magellanic Clouds. Um, so that's the, um, the large and small Magellanic clouds, with a, which are galaxies that are actually merging with our own. They're falling into the Milky Way and being gobbled up as we speak. But even now, the Milky Way, looking at the entire galaxy, that's still, maybe we've gotten into our, our sort of suburb now, but we still haven't um, barely left the, um, the neighborhood. Um, and it's images like this that give you a sense of the sort of the scale of the universe. This is the Hubble deep, ultra deep field. Um, and basically every dot that you see in here is a galaxy. Galaxies like our Milky Way contain hundreds of billions of stars. So even the smallest dots in this picture basically are each hundreds of billions of stars. I see two individual stars here. One is this one right here with the, the crosshairs that you can see just here. I'll do this online so people can see online as well. And there's another one up there somewhere, yeah, up there. Every other dot is a galaxy. And the light from some of these galaxies has been traveling for almost 13 billion years. And so to put that in perspective, who knows how old the Earth is? Six Got a few different, different guesses. It's about four and a half billion years old. Uh, so the light has been traveling for more than two and a half times the age of the Earth. So this light was emitted before our sun had even formed, before we had even come close to having our sun formed. And the first thing that the light has hit is the mirror of our telescope. And we can see that and understand what it is. And I find that absolutely astonishing. Now, this was from Hubble, but we all know that there's a successor to Hubble that has gone up recently, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. I hope you got as excited about the JWST um, images as I did. Um, here's an even deeper image than that one that I was showing before. Um, and you're really almost seeing out to the edge of the observable universe here. So I, I often say that when I go to, a, go to a pub and admit that I'm an astrophysicist, I often get asked the question of, um, 
so what do you do? Do you like discover galaxies and classify galaxies? I'm saying, well, sort of, but if it's actually really easy to discover galaxies. You just take a bigger telescope than everybody else and you point at a, a particular spot in the sky for long enough and you see fainter and fainter galaxies that were just previously too faint to see. But with images like this, that is almost no longer true because you are looking so far out into the universe that you are looking so far back in time that you're looking back to a time before galaxies existed. And this is almost a complete census of all of the galaxies in that direction of the sky out to beyond where, galax beyond where galaxies had formed. And I, I skipped a step there, but basically the, one of the important things in cosmology is like it takes so long for light to get to us that we genuinely are looking at the universe as it was in the past. Uh, and so we can actually see galaxy evolution happening, even though we can't watch the movie, because we can see old, young galaxies in the, in the distant universe and older galaxies in the nearby universe and figure out how the, those um, dots connect. So it's very, very cool. Now, it's the power of telescopes like this um, that has allowed us to discover some really strange things about the universe. And the two strange things I'm going to talk most about tonight are these two things dark matter and dark energy. And they're both called dark, but they're very, very different. Firstly, dark matter, it has extra gravity. It clumps. It's, it's sort of the structure that binds the galaxies together. Um, and uh, so it, it pulls. Dark energy, on the other hand, it appears to be accelerating the entire expansion of the universe. It pushes galaxies away from each other. So while dark matter holds individual galaxies together, dark energy pushes galaxies away from each other. Um, and these t I'm going to tell you the story of how these two things were discovered uh, and what they mean for the fundamental physics of our universe. OK, you ready? I've got a lot to show you, so let's see how, far, how fast we can go. Ready? Um, OK, starting out, the very first step of this thing is the discovery of the expansion of the universe itself. Very, very fundamental. Now, when, when you look at these images like over here, there's a very big challenge in astronomy of figuring out how far those galaxies are away because it's very difficult to tell the difference between a really big galaxy far away that looks like a tiny dot or a little tiny dot, tiny galaxy nearby that also looks like a tiny dot of the same brightness. So in order to try and figure out how bright something, how far something really is away, you, what you need is some sort of indicator of distance. And the first really good distance indicator was a star called a Cepheid variable. And there's Henrietta Swan Leavitt up in the, in the left there who discovered that there was a relationship with this variable star that how rapidly they pulsed told you how bright they were intrinsically. So that meant that by measuring how rapidly they pulsed, you could figure out how intrinsically bright they are. And now that breaks that degeneracy because that means that you know how bright they are intrinsically, which means if you look at how bright they appear, you can tell how far they are away. It's called having a standard candle. And it's exactly the same principle as if I, in a completely dark room, held a candle like right up in front of your face, um, and then ran down the road uh, 100 metres and held it up 100 metres away, you can make a pretty decent guess at how far I was just because you know how bright candles are. So it's just quantifying that and applying it to these variable stars. Now, you need two things in order to discover that the universe is expanding. You need to measure the distance, but you also need to measure the velocity, how fast things are moving. And the way that you do that is with the Doppler shift or with the, the light gets shifted to redder wavelengths if something is moving away from you and to bluer wavelengths if something moving towards you. And it's exactly the same principle that you use uh, in a, like a radar gun or the police use in a radar gun to tell how fast you're moving um, in, in your car. They shoot light at you, it bounces back and it, you can see how fast you're going. It's also the reason that race cars sound like Meow! Because in sound, it's a similar effect. You get a high pitch as something's coming towards you and a low pitch going away. So there was a bunch of people uh, involved in this initial discovery, uh, Slipher, Henrietta, but the most, one that got most famous for it is Hubble. Um, and uh, I should also mention George Lemaitre, who did discover the expansion of the universe first, but didn't really get any credit for it. But Hubble got the telescope named after him, and this is his plot. And he plotted the 
the thing that was interesting that was discovered was that the, all of the galaxies are going wrong. They're like all going away from us. They've all got red shifted light. It's shifted towards the red. Um, and that means, that, and you, they measured how fast they were, they were going, and the ones that were going fastest were the ones that were furthest away. And so that was the discovery that the universe is expanding. Okay, hopefully I didn't lose anybody there. This is the data as of 1929, actually 1931. Um, this is a little bit better version of it, where I've zoomed in down there. Hubble's data went to a redshift. Redshift is like measuring how fast those things are moving away. Redshift of 0 0.003. So very small compared to modern days. And this is one of the things that we've done with the Dark Energy Survey um, and mapped that out to much, much greater distances and obviously confirmed that spectacularly. So this is the results that the velocity is proportional to the distance and we um, call the Hubble parameter H, the, the proportionality constant in the middle. That doesn't really matter. What everybody asks me as soon as I tell them that the universe is expanding is two things. Where's the center and where's the edge? So I thought I'd try and get those questions out right from the beginning. Okay, so if everything's moving away from everything else, is that if there was a big bang, where did it bang from? Where's everything emerging from? So in order to demonstrate this, I have designed a pattern of dots using Keynote, very sophisticated. I have then expanded this pattern of dots to demonstrate an expanding universe. So this is just slightly bigger than the one before. And then I've superimposed one on the other. And you can see that that little green dot in the middle there is now the center of the universe and everything is emanating away from that, right? So this green dot is the center of this universe. But I can choose any dot here and just, so I've now chosen this one at the top here. Um, and you can see that if I center them so that that's there, it also looks like everything is moving away from that. And interestingly, the velocity is proportional to the distance, the, how far they've gone increases the further you are away from that original point. So velocity is proportional to distance there. And if I move it again, so it's here, then everything looks like it's emanating from here. So what I'm trying to say is that there actually isn't a unique center. You can pick any spot in the expanding universe and call it the center of the universe. Uh, because there is no place that you can put your finger on and say it's emanating from here. It really is that everything is moving away from everything else. Does that make sense? Okay, excellent. So if you want a take-home message, it is that you are the center of the universe, <laughs> but so is everybody else. Okay, and these days we make some beautiful maps of the distribution of galaxies in the universe. This is one, an early one from the Six Degree Field Survey, and this is the kind of thing where we're, we're sitting at the center here, and each dot here is a galaxy that's been mapped and measured how fast it's moving away and put that on this, this sort of three-dimensional map of the universe. This one was in the Southern Hemisphere, which is why they didn't observe up there. And can anyone guess why there's this gap here? The Milky Way. That beautiful Milky Way that I was talking about earlier, it looks lovely in the night sky. It's extremely annoying for cosmologists because it obscures everything that's behind it. So we can't actually see what's going on behind it. Okay, so that was the discovery of the expansion. I'll get to the edge in a minute. Um, now I wanna talk about the discovery of dark matter. Now the expansion was discovered in the late 1920s. Now, the first mention of dark matter in the literature is 1933. So basically, hot on the heels of expansion, uh, dark matter was sort of blindingly obvious. The way it was measured was by this guy, Fritz Zwicky, and what he looked at was clusters of galaxies. So here in this animation, you see a simulation of uh, formation of a cluster of galaxies. Those little puffs on the outskirts are all individual galaxies that are coming into a cluster and orbiting each other. Um, so what he noticed was that if you measure how fast they're orbiting, they're going too fast to be explained by the amount of gravity that you can see in the stars and gas. So the stars and gas just you can measure how much that would weigh. It's just not enough to hold them together in those orbits. It would just like fly apart. So why are they actually successfully orbiting each other? 
That was interesting, but it was pretty much ignored until Vera Rubin came along in the 1960s and discovered that a similar thing was happening in individual galaxies. If you measure how fast a galaxy is rotating, what you expect is to see something that's like on the left here, where the center rotates fast because there's a lot of mass in the, in the center, and in those dense bits, you've got to move fast to avoid falling in. Um, whereas in the outskirts, you should be much able to, you're fur, further away from the source of the gravity, you should be able to go at a nice leisurely pace around the galaxy and not fall in. You don't have to orbit very fast. In fact, if you orbit very fast, you'd fly off into space. That's what we expect. So we expect the, the stars on the outskirts of the galaxies to be going slower than the ones on the inside. That's not what we see. Every spiral galaxy that we see is doing what's happening on the right here. The outskirts are orbiting as fast as the inner part. There's a couple of possible explanations for this. One, uh, we've just got a theory of gravity wrong. It, that doesn't, we you know, we've stuffed up somehow. Um, so gravity doesn't work the way it works here on Earth. Or there, there is some kind of dark matter that we can't see that's adding mass to this galaxy. Um, and we now think that uh, with some of the evidence that hopefully I'll get to later, that it's the latter of those two. It's most probably a type of particle or some type of stuff out there that's just dark. It doesn't shine, it doesn't glow, so we can't see it. And it also doesn't interact with us much. So it doesn't bounce off us, it doesn't have pressure. It's not a particle that will bounce off other particles, it will just like whoosh straight through the Earth. Uh, and so we don't detect it by touching it. We can't see it, we can't feel it, but we, all we can see is its gravitational effects. So we see how it's making things move. Uh, and that's um, why we think it's out, we know it's out there. Now I'll get, I'll get to more evidence for dark matter later, but that's the first of the dark things. We think it makes up about 25% of the energy density of the universe. The other dark thing is dark energy. So go back to the 1990s, and well, actually, ever since the discovery of expansion, there was a big question. Is the expansion going fast enough to escape, so the galaxies can ex escape each other's gravity? So here on Earth, if I, if I jump up, gravity will pull me back down, right? But who, does anyone know the escape velocity of Earth? 11 kilometers per second. So if I jump at 11 kilometers per second off the Earth, then in the absence of a ceiling and air resistance, uh, I would escape Earth's gravity and never come back. So the question is, do the, the uh, galaxies have the escape velocity from each other so that the universe will expand forever, or will gravity slow down the expansion and make the, make the expansion recollapse? So this was basically the debate that was going on until the 90s when people were like, hey, do you know what, we can measure this. And the way that it was possible to measure it was by using a new type of standard candle. Not those Cepheid variables we had before, but supernovae, exploding stars. Now, these, they found in the 90s that there's this particular type of exploding star that always explodes to about the same brightness. Perfect, it's gonna be great for that standard candle that we, were, that we need to measure distances. Even better than that, um, a, this supernova, when it goes off, is so bright that a single exploding star can outshine all of the light from the hundreds of billions of stars in the host galaxy. This is important because we weren't able to see Cepheids to great distances, but supernovae, we can see them out. And basically, as long as we can see galaxies, we can see these exploding stars. And that means while we can see very far away and measure distances far away, and what did I say about being far away before? Things that are far away, we're seeing them as they were in the past. So we're able to see and measure how fast the universe was expanding in the past. Uh, and that ha allowed people to test whether that expansion has slowed down enough to make the universe recollapse or not. So that's what these guys went out to do. On the left, you have Brian Schmidt, currently the, or oh, just retiring from being the um, vice chancellor of ANU. Uh, Saul Perlmutter, and for my first postdoc, I had both of these guys simultaneously as my boss. Um, and they went out and measured this. So they had two big teams, and with 52 supernovae between them, they discovered that something weird was happening. So none of what we thought was happening is actually true. The universe is actually speeding up. Its expansion is accelerating. So gravity appears to be pushing instead of pulling, and we don't know why. Whatever's causing that push is given the name dark energy, and that's what I've spent most of my career trying to find out. 
and sorry to my bosses in the room, uh, failing so far. Uh, but we've measured it to ever more precision to, under to measure its properties ever more precisely. So we are narrowing down on what it could possibly be. Now, in detail, if I go in detail, the universe actually decelerated for about half its life and then started to accelerate. Uh, and that would be consistent if, if something had, if you have lots of mass and it's really dense when the universe is smaller, it's like close together, and then the universe expanded and the mass sort of dropped off, or the density dropped off, and this dark energy started to take over. If the dark energy was a constant background, which we think it was, that's why the, that sort of deceleration and acceleration happened. I won't go into too much detail on that because I don't have a, a lot of time, but I'll just say that the the acceleration of the expansion of the universe was accepted remarkably quickly. And one of the reasons was in the 90s, there was a big debate in cosmology because there was a lot of things wrong. Number one, people who measured stars could tell that the oldest stars in the universe were about 14 billion years old. Uh, but the people measuring the expansion thought that the universe was about nine and a half billion years old. So the stars were older than the universe and you know some people thought that was a problem. Uh, the number of galaxies was also wrong. People counted how many galaxies there were in a volume of space here, counted how many galaxies were in a distant volume of space, and the distant one, there was just way too many. You couldn't justify how many we see at the present day if it grew from a universe that looked like that in the past. So that was also a big puzzle. And then the mass in the universe didn't add up. We knew that the universe was, it was a good theoretical expectation that it was spatially flat, uh, triangles added up to 180 degrees, but um, the, there wasn't enough mass. You counted that even the dark matter didn't add up to enough. Only it added up to only about 30% of what you needed for that to be true. So there was a problem with the mass of the universe, and dark energy solved all of these. So, firstly. Uh, the fact that some stars are older than the universe, and I've chucked a figure in here for the, um, everybody who likes figures. If you look at the size of the universe relative to time, and we know how fast it's expanding now, if it decelerated, so it was slowing down to that speed, then the age is only about nine and a half billion years. But if it decelerated, then accelerated to that speed, then the age is older. So it, in one fell swoop, made the age of the universe old enough to encompass the age of the oldest stars. So now the stars were younger than the universe. All of those conferences on that topic could be abandoned because it was all solved. Everybody was happy. Number density. Once you realize that the expansion is accelerating, you realize that you, had just, you hadn't been counting galaxies wrong. You'd been measuring the volume wrong. You just got the distances wrong. And so it was the denominator of the equation, not the, not the numerator, that was, causing, that was causing so much strife. And so it actually corrected the number density of the universe as well. And then the mass of the universe, well, this dark energy, the amount that you need to explain the observations was 70% of the energy density of the universe. And voila, that solved all of the problems. Uh, and these guys got the Nobel Prize for that in 2011. So here they are looking a little bit more distinguished than they were when they were pretending to fight at a conference. Um, okay, so that was, that's the discovery of dark energy. Now I thought I'd give a quick interlude now about one of the projects that I've, that's close to my heart that I've been working on for a long time, and that's the Dark Energy Survey. Uh, and we, I started on this project in 2012, but it was with an instrument that was, people had been working on for a decade before that. Um, and it's on this beautiful telescope in Chile. Um, this is the camera that we have. It's a 570 megapixel camera. That's the one of the lenses. And it makes beautiful images somewhat like this, which I hope that you can see well. Um, but the, the cool thing about this is that it's a huge field of view. So one picture takes something that's, you know, that's relative to the size of the full moon. You can fit four, mo four full moons across in one of these images. So you can observe big patches of the sky at once. Um, and you observe that to a really beautiful sort of um, resolution across the entire field of view. So it's just an incredible instrument. And we spent um, six years observing with this instrument. Uh, and we released, just a couple of years back now, um, a catalog of 543 million galaxies um, that you can go download yourself if you like. Be warned, it's a, it's a table that has 271 rows and 540, or columns and 543 rows, of million rows, so uh, it does take a little bit of time to download. Um, but 
Uh, yeah, especially if you go the raw, ter raw, da raw data. We were making um, 24, uh, 2.4 terabytes a night for um, several years. Um, so it was a lot of data. Um, but amongst this, we discovered thousands of supernovae, about 2,000 that are good enough to do cosmology with. And that was one of the things that we were most interested in because we wanted to confirm this dark energy measurement and do a better job of measuring the dark energy. And so in order to do that, remember, we not, don't just need the supernovae. We need to measure their, their spectrum of their light, split the light into the rainbow and measure how fast they're moving away using the redshift. So we use this, t this instrument here on the Anglo-Australian telescope, where what this guy is doing is putting optical fibers on this plate. And they're strategically positioned at the, p at the positions of galaxies that we have already taken an image of using the dark energy camera that's over in Chile. And what we do is we flip this over, point it at the, the telescope, uh, point it at like this patch of sky, and there's an optical fiber, accepts, each optical fiber accepts the light from one galaxy. Uh, and that lets you measure the spectra of hundreds of galaxies at a time. Um, it's a beautiful, uh, it was way before its time, state-of-the-art instrument. You get pretty spectra like this, but then you get to make cool little animations like this, where this is the four patches of the sky that we looked at, and those sparkles are just the supernovae that we saw going off. If you recall, we, um, the Nobel Prize winning research, one team had 42 supernovae in one color, the other team had 10 supernovae in two colors. We have almost 2,000 supernovae in five colors that we're gonna release the data for hopefully in the next couple of months. So that's very exciting. This was some of our preliminary data that I showed you before with only a couple of hundred supernovae on it. Uh, we've got a few thousand coming up, so that's very exciting. But, that was just the tip of the iceberg. The, the, the dark matter uh, from rotating galaxies and the supernova was just like, that was only a tiny sampling of the amount of evidence we have for dark energy and dark matter now. So I'm gonna dive forwards through, through to this. Now, the, one of the first pieces of evidence that I'm gonna show you is related to this question of where is the edge of the universe? Um, and to some extent, that's like the ancient mariners asking, where's the edge of the earth? Uh, it might be that there is no edge, that it goes all the way around. We don't know because we can't actually see beyond our horizon. Now, there's a horizon on Earth, which you can extend if you walk to the top of your mast or if you make a bigger tall ship, uh, you can see further around the Earth. But there is a horizon to the universe that's limited by how far light was able to travel from the beginning of the universe until now. Um, and what you're seeing here, slowly moving, this is actually an animation, is a real simulation of what the, how we think the structure formed in our universe. And this simulation is called the horizon run because it basically is showing a simulation of the universe out to that horizon, um, that which was, has gone through a supercomputer. And you can see you get this sort of filamentary structure of clusters of galaxies and voids. Um, and this is basically sort of what we think something close to the uh, entire observable universe would look like. And this is once they've zoomed out. And you can see the bit around the edge is brown and stuff, and it's slightly red because that was when the universe was a bit more homogenous. You're looking back in time to look before the galaxies had fully formed. Uh, and this doesn't go quite to the edge of what we think our horizon is, but it's pretty close. And that's the kind of data that we're, that we're looking for. So that's, there's no edge to the universe necessarily, but there is an edge to how far we can see. Um, that's a patch of our observable universe. And the very edge of our observable universe gives us some really, really good evidence for dark energy and dark matter. And that's because if you look beyond here, remember I said there's no galaxies beyond here, you're looking back to before galaxies had formed? Well, if you go past, you see something called the cosmic microwave background. This is not the cosmic microwave background, it's an oval that I drew in Keynote. Um, however, it is a good indication of the fact that we expect that we get the same um, cosmic microwave background from all directions, because this is the afterglow that was left over from the Big Bang. And these guys found it in their telescope uh, in the 60s, and they got a Nobel Prize for just discovering that it was there. But in the 1990s, it was measured, there was these fluctuations in it, and these are different fluctuations that are just a tiny bit hotter or a tiny bit colder than this leftover afterglow from the Big Bang sort of average. And it's been measured a bunch of times, and I'm, I'm not gonna go in, given the time I have, I'll go very, very briefly into the fact that the, the thing that is causing some of these oscillations, and as I go through in, in time here, this is like the telescope from the 
the noughties, and this is the telescope from the 2010s, um, and each time you get slightly better resolution. Okay, so now what you're doing, have, have anyone heard that you cannot have sound in space? Yep. That wasn't true back here. We're looking back to a time when the entire universe was as dense as like the, near the surface of our sun. Um, and back then, sound was traveling everywhere. In fact, it was traveling at more than half the speed of light. Um, and if you go back to the very primordial universe, the very beginning of the universe, where the, everything was so dense, it was just this big plasma, sound was traveling everywhere, and there were certain patterns in the sound that, were, that sort of emerged, sort of like the distance that um, light could, or sound could travel from the beginning of the universe until the point where the universe expanded so much that light could travel freely, left its imprint in the patterns that you see here. And that was predicted, and people were able to use this to measure how much dark energy and dark matter um, there are. Now, I don't have time to go into that in any enormous detail, but it is super, super cool. And the pattern that you expect to see is this red line here. This is basically how strong fluctuations are as a function of scale. And it doesn't matter if you're afraid of, of plots, this is a beautiful fit between the prediction, which is in red, and the data, which is in blue. The data do have error bars on them. They're just too small to see for the most part. And this was a prediction with dark matter and dark energy. Now, if I take away from the dark energy from this prediction, uh, that's what you would see. That's what you would predict. And if I take away the dark matter, then that's what I would predict. It would be a terrible fit to this data. Now, I know I haven't gone through this in enough detail to explain to you really why these fluctuations are there very well and what, pa what this pattern really shows. All I want you to take away from this is that we have this measurement of this leftover light from the beginning of the universe, and there are sound waves imprinted in it, and we measured those sound waves and found evidence for dark energy and dark matter in those sound waves, which is a completely different mechanism than rotating galaxies and supernovae. And it's this completely different way of measuring the same thing uh, that's got us so convinced that this dark energy and dark matter really are out there. But if you're not convinced yet, I have more. Um, because they, this also, that, that was the primordial universe from which our current universe formed. And there's these hot spots and cold spots for like over densities and under densities. It's a sound wave, which is like a compression, right? And if you just freeze a sound wave for a while, these dense spots, what happens when you've got something that's dense here and something that's less dense here, and you just let gravity do its thing? The dense thing is where galaxies are going to form, because that's where something will, will start collapsing. And what you're seeing here is another simulation where you start with a pretty smooth background, but with the same patterns that we see in that cosmic microwave background I was just showing. And you do a supercomputer simulation, forward, fast forward it, and then see what pattern of galaxies you would expect to see today. And we've gotten out and measured that. And the survey that we led from UQ was called the Wiggles uh, Dark Energy Survey. Um, yes, I know, because we're looking for these wiggles in that, that power spectrum that you were looking at earlier. Um, and the blue dots here are galaxies that we observed in six different patches of the sky, or seven different patches of the sky. And in that, we measured in the distribution of galaxies the sound waves that were predicted from the Big Bang. And that means, so if you, another take home message that you could walk away with tonight is that the pattern of galaxies in the universe is not random. It actually sits in a sound wave pattern um, that has the leftover imprint of the conditions from the very early universe in it. And we've used this to measure, that basically is a ruler. You know how we were using those standard candles to me measure the distances? We're using this pattern as a ruler to measure distances as well. And with this, we've also confirmed dark energy and dark matter. Now, I could go on. There's also gravitational lensing, which is super awesome. And I could, I could list another 20 different measurements of different ways in which we've confirmed dark energy and dark matter. But I'll almost finish up soon so that we have a bit of time for questions. But I wanted to mention a couple of projects that I'm working on uh, in addition to the dark energy survey that I was just talking about. One's the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, similar name different aim. Uh, it's here, remember the, that robot that I showed you earlier positioning optical fibers at the positions of interesting galaxies? That had 400 optical fibers. We're working with a survey now that has 5,000 optical fibers. 
Um, and there's a few of the postdocs in the, in the audience. Uh, we've got a, a whole uh, army of postdocs and PhD students and honours students and stuff at UQ working on this at the moment. Um, and the cool thing about this one, in contrast to the other, is that each optical fibre has its own robot. So there are 5,000 optical fibres controlled by 5,000 robots, and you can simultaneously move them all to get to position them on the positions of galaxies. So that Wiggles survey that I was talking to you about before, um, we measured, so this is, or this is a, a field, we, we actually just, the stuff that we measured with the dark energy survey is part of the, the input catalog that goes into this. So you can download and have a look at this yourself. You can go and explore these images. Um, but you go like this and you figure out which targets you want to look at and then you tell that 5,000 optical fibres to lay something on here uh, on, those, on those targets. And we've been working for less than two years um, and we've already mapped 10 million galaxies um, in their 3, 3D distribution here. Um, and to put, <laughs> put that in perspective, so when I moved to UQ in 2008, it was to work on Wiggles. Uh, and we spent five years doing, wi with um, over 100, 200 nights on the telescope, excuse me, 200 nights on the telescope, and we measured um, 240,000 galaxies. Um, and in one night with DESI, they already measured 100,000 galaxies. So that was like, it's both exciting and depressing that I spent, you know, like <laughs> five years of my time doing what they did in three days. But, um, but now that's, that's how you build to be able to build these instruments is doing those earlier experiments and figuring out that actually we do need to build these, these bigger ones. Um, and you can actually watch some of this soon. Hopefully, um, we've got a planetarium show that we've made of this. So you can go and check this out, hopefully at the planetarium here in Brisbane before too long. Now, to finish up, there's a couple of other really cool um, things going on. We've got the Vera Rubin Observatory, and I put this one up partly because I went there um, at the end of last year to film a new episode of Catalyst. So the new episode of Catalyst is about dark energy and dark matter, uh, and so it's exactly the topic of this lecture. But during that episode, I get to do indoor skydiving and roll, roller derby, and I get to go into a nuclear reactor and uh, do a whole bunch of different things, including going up to the telescopes. So things that I couldn't bring here uh, on stage. So you get to, you get to see that. Um, OK, so to, to polish off, what are these things? I've talked about measurements of dark energy and dark matter. I haven't actually talked about what they are. So I talked a little bit about what dark matter was. And the leading candidate is really that it's a new type of particle. It could possibly be some sort of like primordial black holes, like lots of floating around black holes. But the leading thing is it's a new type of particle. It's just not the type of particle that's on the standard model of particle physics. We think it makes up about 25% of the universe. I forgot to mention that the stuff that we're made out of, that all of the particles that are on the periodic table, light, everything thing like that, no more than 5% of the energy density of the universe. So we're like the icing on the cake. Uh, the dark matter and dark energy are really the, the, the meat of the cake. Um, and what is dark energy? Well, there's, it could be the energy of the vacuum itself. Because what we've measured of it, as we've measured its properties more precisely, we can tell that it doesn't actually change. It's like the, the constant background that, um, that as the universe dilutes and the matter goes away, this acceleration seems to be taking over more and more, but it's just a constant background. And so what's constant in the, in the background is like the vacuum. Uh, and there are good reasons from quantum physics why you would expect the vacuum to have a property of a repulsive force. The only problem is that the prediction from quantum physics about how much there should be of it is a tiny bit off. Um, <laughs> Someone in the audience already knows the answer to this one. The tiny bit is 120 orders of magnitude. Um, <laughs> here, take or, take or leave it a little bit. So basically, that's a huge. It's, one, it's the worst non-infinite prediction that anyone has ever made, I think. Um, so uh, my hope is actually that by studying this, we're going to understand how to merge quantum physics and gravity, which is basically one of the holy grails of modern physics, because we don't know how those two theories go together. This may be some of the only observational evidence that we have to point us in the right direction for what those theories need to do um, when we put them together. And so that's, real, that's pretty cool. Um, now, it could be something that we haven't thought of yet. I'm going to get asked this question, so I'll preempt it. 
Um, someone, there was a thing that came out recently about the fact that dark energy is black holes. Um, and this is a very, very, very speculative um, theory, but it's talking about the possibility that there's some sort of like uh, sort of pushing coming from black holes. Um, if someone wants to know more, we can probably talk about it and, and chat about it in the outside, but that's just one of literally hundreds, probably thousands of theories that have come out to try and explain what this dark energy could be. Um, now, one of the tools that I'm very, very excited about to be able to measure um, interesting things about the, the universe and about dark energy and dark matter are gravitational waves. How many people have heard of gravitational waves? Yeah, so we've got this new center of excellence that we're starting up. It's, it's sort of a continuation of our current center of excellence, but UQ is coming in as a node, and I get to um, help be a bit of a leader in this one. And we're going to have a, a whole heap of people trying to use gravitational waves, which are ripples in space time, to measure the expansion of the universe more precisely than we can with supernovae. And it, it, this is really cool. OK, and so to polish off, We've got the, the why do we do this kind of thing. Um, I won't go through these. This is, a gra this is a gravitational wave mirror on the left. This is Super Cameo Conde, a, a, um, a uh, neutrino detector on the right. This is, does anyone know what that is? It's the Large Hadron Collider up here. This is, the, this is me looking very, I actually was surprised at just how excited I got to go down in the tunnels in LIGO, or not in LIGO, in, in the Large Hadron Collider, um, and the JWST telescope. Um, and we've got all these amazing pieces of equipment, and we're, with them, we're all trying to do the, a similar thing. We're trying to understand the fundamental nuts and bolts of our universe and how it all works. Um, but along the way, even if we don't ever figure that out, we make all sorts of good new technology. We, lots of, we, a lot, there's a whole heap of spin-offs that come from doing this kind of research. Um, for example, some of my friends who uh, were looking at the, like, the people who looked at discovering supernovae and measuring, which you basically do by looking at images and see what changes in those images. They've adapted that and turned it into an app that can be used to take pictures of your moles and detect skin cancers. Um, there's people working on medical imaging. There was a new radiotherapy device that, was u that uses some of the technology that we use to target our telescopes, but it targets the, the correct organs in the body and does a rapid fixing as, you, as someone can move around. And there's all sorts of cool spin-offs that you can get, quite apart from all of the data, data science things with the, that I was talking about before, and the machine learning and artificial intelligence stuff that we do with this as well. So there's sort of a, a variety of streams of, you know, it's useful because we figure out fundamental physics and it's useful because we uh, have all sorts of cool spin-offs that come from it. But I actually think that one of the most important things of this is what it teaches about ourselves and where we sit in the universe and just us as a human species. And I think it's the kind of research that I like to do because it te teaches us, you know, the, the question of uh, how did we come to be and what is happening around us and taking us out of our tiny little perspective of what ha what's happening to tomorrow and what stress is in my life. When you look up and you look at just how big the universe is and how precious life is here on Earth and how precious that little tiny sliver of atmosphere is that we have around us, then I think it brings a lot of the world problems into perspective. And that's one of the reasons that I like studying this stuff. So I'll leave you in a nice, calming image of a tree. <laughs> And I, I brought this up because I, I, I often like and that make the analogy of dark energy and dark matter. Like, when, when have you been, ever been asked to believe so many things that you can't see? The variety of places. But, um, but when you look at, a, look at this, if you look at the trees, move their leaves blowing around in the wind, you can't see the air, right? But you can see the effect of the air. You can see the leaves moving. Similarly, we can't see dark energy and dark matter, but we can see their effects really, really clearly. Uh, and uh, that's how we're, that, if you look, think back 200 years, we didn't actually know what dark energy, what, what the, the air was made of. We didn't have a particle theory of matter. We didn't have the periodic table. Think about how far we'll be in 200 years from now and if we're going to be able to figure out what dark matter and, matter and dark energy are to the same level that we now understand the matter that um, makes up our everyday lives. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much.
Wow. <laughs> what a tour de force. Questions? Yes, anyone questions? Amazing. Okay, I've already got a bunch of questions coming in. This is your chance to add to them. You can still see the QR code there. If you are online, you can check out the link there to the question list. All right, um, let's go. Um, first question is from Paul. Um, how many supernova are firing off in the universe at any one point in time? So the rate of supernovae going off is typically about one every 400 years per galaxy. Um, so if there's, you can do the maths, if there's uh, however many hundred billion galaxies in the universe, et cetera. Um, so they're, they're reasonably frequent, but it means if you want to, if we want to observe one supernova per year, if we just observe 400 galaxies, then on average, a supernova will go off in that 400 galaxies once per year. So the reason that we needed that wide field telescope to be able to observe many, many more galaxies than 400 is because we wanted to find more than that. So we were finding a supernova every couple of days instead. Amazing. Andy asks, do you think the laws of physics are different closer to the edge of the universe? This is actually a really interesting question and something that we've gone out and measured. And there's uh, people in the audience who I know who are uh, measuring things about whether the fundamental constants of nature vary. Um, so it's, if the laws of physics were different in these different galaxies, then it should be something that we should observe. And one of the things that's been measured is like, for example, is the, the, the fine structure constant, which is a combination of the speed of light, Planck's constant, which is one of the important ones in quantum physics, and the charge on the electron. If that changes, then the levels in the atoms would also change. And the spectra, the rainbow of light that you get emitted from those different objects would change. And those lines would shift in different ways. And so people have gone out and really, really carefully measured whether there's any difference in the spectra of things from far away and nearby. It looks like really there, there was some, maybe some hints of it, but m most likely it looks like it, there is no change. And if there is, it's very, very small. And so we, we, gen we don't just make the assumption that the laws of physics are the same everywhere. We go out and actually test that really actively. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to change tack a little bit. We'll come back to the hardcore physics questions in a moment, um, of which there are a large and increasing number on the <laughs> question list here. Um, but a uh, question from Annika, how did you get into the field of cosmology and particularly dark matter and energy? And also, Leonardo asks, what was your experience moving into a uh, typically male-dominated field, and do you have any um, suggestions to a young woman following a similar path today? Yes. So I got into astrophysics by, a bit by accident. I didn't know what I wanted to do at high school. Uh, I was looking at, but I knew I was like slightly good at science, and I loved science fiction movies, and I liked watching the, the like the, the the space shuttle launches and all this sort of stuff. And then I was like, oh, well, I might as well do, I looked at things and I thought I might as well do physics. So I did physics and I did an arts degree as well alongside that, so a double degree, did a degree in philosophy as well as the physics degree. And then at the end of that, there was like this really, like these really cool projects that you could choose for honors in physics. And um, I could either ask the question of does the expansion of the universe go faster than the speed of light, which was my honors project, or, um, to design better cochlear implants where you uh, can, for the hearing, um, the hearing aid type of things. And those were the two questions, and both looked super interesting to me, but I ended up deciding on the astrophysics one. And then when I was in a, uh, at a conference down in Canberra, after, as I was finishing my, in the last year of my PhD, this guy came up to me and said, you, like, you, know, you were asking some really good questions at this conference. Do you have a job after you've finished your PhD? And I was like, no, I, well, uh, I don't have a job yet. And I, you know, I meant to go overseas for my job, but um, I have to stay in Australia because I want to play this weird sport called Ultimate Frisbee. Uh, and there's a World Championships next year, and they only happen once every four years. And so this guy was, was like, oh, do you know what? I think I can make up a job for you for a year. Um, and that was the person who made up the job for me for a year was a guy called Brian Schmidt who was the one who would go on to win the Nobel Prize. And so that was very useful a connection to make that, was, that, that I made partly because I was drinking a beer at a conference asking interesting questions and partly because I wanted to play ultimate frisbee in Australia. Um, the question about the gender thing is, uh, I have had nothing but absolute outstanding support from all of my colleagues of all genders as I have gone through my career and have never felt disadvantaged because of my, my gender. And I think it, it's, there's never, 
there's a lot of it. There is there are unconscious biases, but it's never been a better time to be a, a, a female in astrophysics or any of the any of the sciences. Um, and if you're interested in doing it, go for it. It's great fun. <laughs> And now getting back to dark energy, <laughs> um, got a question from Isaac and a related one from Asaf, who's eight. Uh, is it possible for dark energy and dark matter to meet and what would happen if they did? Excellent question. Where's Asaf? Is he, is he in the audience? Um, hey. So yes, the, um, the and over there, hey. <laughs> um, so the dark energy and dark matter are sort of meeting all the time because the dark matter we think is all around us. So it's, and so is the dark energy, especially if it's the energy of the vacuum, it's the energy is sort of empty space, it would sort of be everywhere. Um, and so there, everything is sort of overlapping. Uh, the, one of the ways that people wanna measure dark matter is by seeing occasional very rare collisions with normal matter that we think doesn't happen very, very often at all. Um, but you would do that by measuring sort of the, the the wind of dark matter, there's one of, one of the ways. But anyway, I won't go in too much into that in detail. There are theories where people have proposed where dark energy and dark matter are the same thing. There's something that causes both of them simultaneously. Um, and so there are some theories that try and merge them. None of them are better than the ones we have at the moment, that, but there, there are some that are proposed. I, I made the mistake of refreshing the question list and now there's twice as many as there was a moment ago. Um, uh, okay, Yanni, you, you, you get to the top of the list here because I'm a Marvel fan. Does the multiverse, multiverse actually exist? Cool. Okay, so there are many, there's a several different multiverse levels that you can go to. So first, firstly, there, the multiverse it does exist in the sense that, remember we have our patch of the observable universe? That's not all of the universe that there is. There, we have no reason to expect that just because we can't see beyond this patch that the universe ceases out there. So there's almost certainly multi-universes, but if you take different patches within this big universe that is ours, there is, the proposal and one of the quantum physics ideas is that there is a multiverse in the sense that every decision that we make or every um, even particle collision basically branches off an, an entire new universe in the sort of a probabilistic sense, which to me personally seems pretty wasteful. Um, making you, all of these new universes, but it is a, a theory that's taken seriously out there. And unfortunately, we don't know whether there are multiverses or not. Um, and it's very, it's one of these things that's probably gonna be really difficult to ever tell, unless cause we can't measure it. The best we can do is make predictions. If a multiverse exists, then something about what we can observe would, must be true. And there's a few things with anthropic arguments and stuff like that, which I won't go into at the moment, but there are, there's, it's a really interesting discussion. Um, three more questions, I think. Uh, we'll see how we go. Okay, from Adam asks, do we have a good reason to believe that dark matter may interact with fundamental forces that aren't gravity? Or are we just hoping so, so that we stand a chance of observing it? Cool, so there, there's, there is a proposal that dark matter and or dark energy could represent some kind of fifth force. So we have four, well, depending on how you count, four forces that we usually recognize as the, um, the gravity, there's electromagnetic, there's the strong and the weak forces. Everything but gravity can be merged into one theory. Um, but it's possible that there is some other interaction out there that isn't part of any of those. Um, and so the, the idea of a fifth force being out there is one of the ways that people try and explain dark matter sometimes. Another way that some people try and explain dark matter is to say that gravity actually isn't a force at all. Um, it's actually a, an emergent phenomenon. So an, another example of a, an emergent phenomenon is elasticity. So you know you've got an elastic band, you pull it, it pulls back. And you can write a sim really simple equation for how that works. The force is proportional to how much you stretch the elastic band. But if you go to the fundamental level, then the force is due to the interaction between all of the particles in the elastic. You would have to calculate every single individual little thing. And there's sort of a, a thing that's related to entropy or disorder that says why the elastic band would have to pull. So elastic elasticity is an emergent force. 
And some people propose that gravity is also an emergent force that's like the collective behavior, not of the particles in the elastic, but the collective behavior of some sort of particles of space-time. So the, the range of theories that have been proposed to try and explain dark energy and dark matter is really huge. Uh, more forces, less forces, all sorts of different things. And we still haven't got that really aha moment where someone's come up with something and we go, yeah, that's obviously it. Um, we're still waiting for that aha moment. All right, I have one more question, which is I think in terms of pure mode, the, the most asked question on here, and I know the answer because <laughs> we've talked about it, um, so I think like it. Tell us about your dress. So, <laughs> so if anyone is familiar with gravitational waves, uh, they occur because you've got two massive bodies, for example, two black holes that are orbiting each other, and they lose energy due to gravitational waves and then eventually merge. And when they do that, they go, they have a weak signal at first, and then it gets a, the amplitude increases and the frequency increases, and it looks sort of like this if you plot it. And then it sort of dwindles off as it merges. And so I'm wearing a gravitational wave dress because this is the this is the dress from the first gravitational wave. Well, what a rousing note to finish on. Could you please join me in thanking the incredible Professor Tamara Davis? Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Joel. Briz Science will be back next month. Make sure you sign up to our mailing list or sign up to Facebook to get the notifications. We have some food and drink outside, but please try not to crush and form a black hole on the way out because there's a lot of people tonight. And thank you everyone online. We'll see you all next month. Have a good one.